I'm reading from the Gospel of John this morning, chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness to the light, that all through him might believe. But he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light, that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those that believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. That's why we're here. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have received, and grace for grace. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him, or he has made him known, or revealed him. Now, in John chapter 1, is one of the most confusing verses in all of the Bible. Verses 1 and, and 2. Uh, they are especially difficult to interpret and understand and, and comprehend. And they express the very essence of the Christmas gospel, which may explain why so few people understand really the meaning, the true meaning of Christmas and what Christmas is all about. The, the key to understanding all that John wrote, all of John's gospel, is in uh, John chapter 20. I'll ask you to turn there just for a moment. We're not going to stay there long, but I want to give you this. One of the things I love about preaching and teaching the book of John, or John, any of John's writing, is he always tells us why he's writing. He always tells us his purpose in writing. And in John chapter 20, in verse 30, he says, Truly Jesus did many other signs or miracles in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, listen, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. We have here two reasons that John gives us for writing. Now John, all of the Gospels are called, uh, the, the writers are called the evangelists. The, the word gospel means good news, the euangelo, the, the, the good message, the good news, the good tidings of great joy, all right? So they all are, have that in common. But John specifically writes, he tells us, for the purpose that we might know Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him we might have life. His purpose was entirely evangelical. And he tells us this, that for this reason he presented a, a representative number of signs or miracles. The word sign means something that is there to convey a message, right? It's not just a historic event that happened, but it has meaning. It has great meaning. It has great significance. The word significance comes from the word sign, right? And this is by no means uh, an exhaustive list. In fact, he says, if I were to try to write all of the miraculous things that Jesus did, 
uh, the world wouldn't be big enough to contain all the books it would take. That's a pretty phenomenal statement. But he says, this is a select representative list of signs and, and wonders, a representative list, if you will, of facts that are recorded for these two purposes, that we might know and come to understand that Jesus, who Jesus is, that he's the Christ, the Son of God, and that then by believing in him, we might have life. So we have two purposes here. Number one, intellectual, that we might know who Jesus is. That we might have a, a, an understanding of who he is, but, but really more than just a, an intellectual uh, understanding, a, a comprehension, but that we would understand that he is the Christ, the, the anointed one, the one sent from God, the Messiah, who fulfilled all the prophecies of the coming Messiah. But more than that, more than just uh, a Messiah and a deliverer and a liberator, which is what the Jews were hoping for, but he is actually the Son of God and God in human flesh. God took on flesh and dwelt among us. He is God in flesh. And he is reasoning here, and we can reason, that if Jesus Christ fulfilled all of these messianic prophecies and signs in his ministry, then he must be the very Son of God. He must be the promised one. And so we have a, an evangelical purpose here. And, and I've said this many, many times, that if, if you will take the Gospel of John, to your loved ones and people that are you're trying to reach and especially during this Christmas season when people tend to be all the more receptive and all the more interested in spiritual things interested in the things of God and ask them to read the Gospel of John with an open mind in fact I've asked people to read John chapter 3 every day for one month read it over and over every day for a month but you can ask people to just read the Gospel of John. Give them a copy of a New Testament in, a, in a, an easy-to-understand version of the Bible. One, one maybe uh, NIV, God forbid. But yeah, I, did I say that? But an ESV or a New King James Version like we re use here in church. But something that they can understand. And ask them to read the Gospel of John and keep an open mind. And then pray for them. Pray for them. For God to open their minds and reveal himself to them. John's stated purpose in writing was so that we might understand who Jesus is and then have life in him. And Isaiah 55 and 11 says, My word that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So I believe that if we will do this and ask people to read this, we can expect that God will make himself known to these people and that they will come away understanding that we cannot be content to just celebrate baby Jesus lying in a manger. We cannot accept just a man, a great man, a great teacher named Jesus Christ, but that we must also understand that the child that was born is the son that was given and he is in fact the mighty God and the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. And we must be willing to confront people with this issue of who Jesus is and his Lordship. It's not enough for them to just believe that he's a historic figure who happened to be born if he was in fact born on December the 25th. That's probably not even when he was really born. But we want them to know Jesus for who he is and understand the issue of his lordship and the fact that he came to save us unto us such is born in the city of david a savior which is christ the lord but john had that intellectual purpose but he also had a very practical and evangelical pur purpose in writing and he says that we might have life through his name he wants us to be saved he wants people to be saved. He wants people to understand that Jesus came, the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. And so, it's a very experiential verse. 
Now, John spoke of these signs or incidents that Jesus did in his ministry uh, that have particular meaning, that prove that he is who he, who he is, the Son of God, God incarnate, the giver of life, the Savior. In John chapter 2, just one chapter over, we read about how Jesus was at a wedding and they had run out of wine, and wine was symbolic of life. Uh, in the Lord's Supper, wine represents the blood, and the life is in the blood, and they had run out of wine, and so he turned water into wine. And not just any wine, but wine that was much better than what they had been serving. And then, in John chapter 11, when he went to the tomb of Lazarus, his friend who had died, and, and make no mistake, Lazarus was dead. Lazarus was a great man, a good man, a good friend, a wonderful person. He only had one problem, and that was that he was dead. And just as you have wonderful neighbors and wonderful relatives and family members and friends that are, are fine people, they only have one problem, and that is they're dead spiritually. And Jesus Christ has come, and he can raise them to life, just as he did with Lazarus. Because he lives, we too shall live, the Bible says. He came uh, not just to reveal himself as a healer. That's why he delayed in going to Lazarus. When Mary and Martha met him, he said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would have died. And I think Jesus said to them, in effect, if I had been here, you'd know me as a healer. And that's a wonderful thing, but I want you to know me even as more than a healer, but as a giver of life. And the life. And so he raised Lazarus from the dead. And so we, we understand there's seven I am statements in the book of John. Seven characteristic miracles that point to who Jesus is. Seven I am statements. And he said in this instance, I am the resurrection and the life. Why did John record these? He tells us so that we too might have life. Because he lives, we too shall live, John 14 and 19. That we might have life and have it abundantly, John 10 and verse 10. To give us life, to call us out of death, to rip away the grave clothes, and to set us free. And so this morning we come to John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Well, what does that mean? All right, let's read it again. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. That didn't help much, did it? You read it again? Let me suggest to you, you read it in a way that we all probably learned to read things. News stories. Back in grade school. What they used to call the, the key words of, of journalism, telling a story. You know, who, what, when, where, why, how, to whom. That's a good way to study your Bible in general, right? Who's speaking? Who is he speaking to? To whom, I should say. Uh, what's he talking about? Where is it taking place? What's the occasion? What's the subject under consideration? You know, that's, that's a, that'll help you to understand your Bible if you'll approach it that way. And so, let's, let's apply those questions here. When did this happen? Right off the bat. In the beginning. In the beginning, we're told when. What? The word was. In the beginning was the Word, all right? Where was the Word? Well, the Word was with God. The Word was God. Who? The Word. Wait, you say the Word. That's not a who. That's a, yes, it is. That's a who. John 4, 1 and 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who, what, when, where, wait, what? The Word was with God. The Word was God. Wait, that, that, that's two things, right? That's two things. 
At this point, we say, oh, forget it. Let's just go to church Sunday. Let's call the pastor, you know, call, ask the pastor, right? Well, guess what? We're going to get into this today. Very confusing verse. A wonderful verse. Wonderful. What does that word mean? It means to wonder after. It's full of wonder. Just like Jesus is full of wonder. It makes us marvel at who he is. It's marvelous. And what a wonderful time of year. The most wonderful time of year is Christmas. And that old song, I wonder as I wander out under the sky. What a wonderful time Christmas is to really meditate on these things. I've told you that the best use for your Christmas tree is to go home and turn off all the lights and just sit in front of your Christmas tree and stare at the lights and, and think about the fact that God became flesh and dwelt among us. It's a wonderful time of year. I, I keep using that word. It's, a, it's the perfect time of year to just try to comprehend all these things. Let's get it. Number one, who? Who are we talking about? Who? Someone, someone identified as the word, the logos. And we're told and we understand that this is none other than Jesus Christ. Again, seven titles he's given in the book of John, seven I am statements. He's the bread of life in chapter six, the light of the world, chapter eight, the door of the sheep in chapter 10, the good shepherd, chapter 10, the resurrection and the life, chapter 11, the way, the truth and the life, chapter 14, the true vine, chapter 15. He is the word. Now, as in all New Testament interpretation, we have basically two ideas here at work. Number one, we need to look at this in the context of who Jesus was and who his disciples were. They were Jews. And so to the Hebrews, the word of God meant something. The word of God had great power and great authority. When the prophets would come to town with their strange dress and their long beards and their honey dripping in their beards and little bits of locust crumbs falling down and their staffs, they would hold up their staffs and they'd say, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. God is speaking with great authority and with great urgency. And we read about this in, in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these days, these last days, spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. Chapter 2 and verse 1 tells us that therefore... We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we've heard, lest we let them slip. How did the prophets come and speak? They came with great authority. They came and spoke the word of God, and, and they were rejected. They were, chapter 11 and verse 37 says, they were stoned, they were sawn in two. That was the fate of Isaiah. They were tempted, they were slain by the sword, they they wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute and afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. You see, God has spoken. He's spoken with great authority, with great urgency. He has sent his final word. Finally, God sent his own son. In Matthew chapter uh, 21 and verses 38 through 44, Jesus tells a parable of, remember, the vine dressers. And God sent messengers to, and then finally, it says, lastly, he sent his own son. And what did they do? They murdered him. Jesus Christ is God's final word, urgent and authoritative. I love that song that uh, Gloria Gaither wrote, that Michael W. Smith recorded. Still some fail to understand it, so God sent his final word on a silent night in Judah's hills. A baby's cry was heard. Is there any wonder 
when we have people today in these groups like the Jesus Seminar a few years ago and, and those that question the word of God just as Satan did in the garden. Has God really said, remember he asked Eve. There is great power in the word of God, in thus saith the Lord. The problem is many, many don't, don't believe it anymore. Many don't believe it anymore. The Greeks had a different concept. The Greeks spoke of the word, the logos, as it's recorded in John chapter 1. And that gets really interesting. You see, because the Greeks had, as one philosopher suggested, over 1,300 meanings for this word, logos, the logos. Now, we're short on time today, so I'm only going to give you about 1,200 of the, no, I'm not either, but we might think of, and I, and I don't mean to be sacrilegious when I say this, but the, the idea comes to mind, you know, the Star Wars movies, the, the Force, that's kind of what we're talking about here. The word logos is from which we get the word logic, the meaning and the order that is behind all things. It's translated here, the word, it's, it's behind everything that there's some unknown meaning, an unknown reason, and the Greeks pondered that and they speculated at it. What, what is that unknown meaning? In fact, you remember when Paul was at the Areopagus on Mars Hill in uh, uh, Acts chapter 17, he, he found an altar that had been erected to the unknown God, and he said, this God that you worship in ignorance, the unknown God, that's the God that I've come to declare unto you. Now, there were other Greek words for word. And one of the things that we do when we study the Greek language is we, we look at the possible alternative words that the writer may have used. There's another word that means word. It's the word lalea. Lalea. Um, lalea means to speak. Uh, laleo means to speak. Lalea is, means a word. But it, it means a word that it's just kind of a lacking of any real content or meaning. Uh, when a baby's born, what's the first thing he or she learns to say? Mama or Dada. And we get all excited. Oh, look at the baby said his first word, Mama. And we don't, and, and it, you know, it may or may not be intentional that they even put those syllables together. The Jewish little babies say Abba. Abba. But those little, ba, ba, you know, that's the easiest thing to say, Abba, Mama, Dada. And, and so we, we associate meaning with that, but it's not, it, it's kind of like if you don't know the words to the song, what do you sing? La, 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 right? Ba, la, 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 right? Deck the halls with balls of holly. Ba, la, 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 la. Somebody actually copyrighted that, and I can't, you know, what does it even mean? Ba, la, 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 la. I love that song, don't get me wrong. But, but in contrast to lalea is the word logos, which means deeply filled with meaning. And the meaning here is that Jesus is in fact the meaning and the reason and the logic behind all things. He is the reason for the season, right? He's the reason for eternity. Colossians 1 and verse 16 says, For by him all things were created, that are in heaven, that are in earth. We read it in John 1 and 1. Uh, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. Colossians says that all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, that are visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is above all things, and in him all things consist. He holds it all together. He's got the whole world in his hands. He is the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. When? When? What did we just say? In the beginning. In the beginning. I like the beginning of John because it says, starts out where? In the beginning. Kind of reminds you of a different book, doesn't it? The book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And by the way, in 
Genesis and in John. There's no argument. There's no apologetic attempt to prove the existence of God. Just a proclamation. In the beginning, God was. In the beginning, God created. So when was the beginning? Well, that's easy. It was in the beginning, right? Well, it's not that easy. I'll give you a, an example. When was the beginning of this church? Well, we say it was 1961 when the church was formally constituted. Okay, but didn't it exist before that? I mean, didn't somebody come with an idea and say, we need to have a church on, on the east end of Decatur, and, and weren't there some home Bible studies that took place, and weren't there a group of people that got together and prayed and you know, went around knocking on doors and trying to get neighbors interested? And, and then, of course, you met over on the other building, over on... Uh, over in town, and then eventually uh, this property was purchased, and this building was built, and and so, I mean, how do we even know when the beginning was? Think of the United States of America. We say the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. The Constitution wasn't ratified until, what, 1789? And of course, we had to fight the Revolutionary War that took all that time, and so when did we really come into being? Listen, scientists today, I, I think it's pretty black and white and cut and dry, but there's people that want to argue about even when life begins. When is the beginning? Well, the British physicist, Sir Bernard Lovell, said that he can't really know. And he came up with a term that he called time equals zero. When was time equals zero? Well, you we can't really know. Kind of hard to answer because the fastest means of measurement that exists is light. And we have been told that the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. And our only reference point and measure is light, and so its origin and creation. And God created the heavens and the earth, and then He said, Let there be light. So Therefore, scientists have concluded that we can't really ever know for certain when time equals zero was, when it all began. So therefore, any theory, whether physical or metaphysical or theological, is equally valid. So we look at what Ken Ham said. Were you there? No. But God was. And God tells us in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. And in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everything that was created was created by Him and for Him. So He was here before creation. God started it all. Theology says in the beginning, God. And one thing we know, the Word was, past tense, already there. John 8 and verse 58, Jesus didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He said before Abraham was, I am. And so we have something revealed to us about God, about Jesus Christ here, is his eternity. His eternity. Micah 5 and verse 2 says, You, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you be little among the thousands of Judea, out of you shall come forth one who shall be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, even from everlasting. Jesus is eternal. He was in the beginning with God. Where was he? There it is, with God. He was with God. With God. I told you the other night that word pros ton theon literally means he was face to face with God. Co-located in the eternal state, in eternal fellowship, in eternal communion. Uniquely able, for that reason, to reveal God to us. Whom are we talking about? We have who, the word, that was in the beginning. That's the when. Where was he? He was with God. What about whom are we talking about? He was God. Literally, God was the word. No, that's not right either. You see, what we have here is another thing about him. We have established his deity. 
He is deity. He is God. Now, many, many cults will tell you that that's not true. They'll, they'll deny this. Islam will deny this. The Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door. The elders will come up on their bikes with their white shirts and white short sleeve shirts and their ties on. They want to talk to you. They'll tell you that no, no, no. Uh, the word was not God. The word was a God. A God. That sounds like something a Jew would write. When the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 tells us that Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And there are no other gods beside him. <laughs> He's not a God. He is God. Not a God. Uh, there's no article before a direct object, they'll say. Well, they're correct, but they don't understand that this is not the direct object. So in John 1.18, I suppose they would want it to say that uh, no one has seen a God at any time, right? No one has seen a God. Well, that's ridiculous. In this idolatrous world, even in Mars Hill in, in Paul's day, there was a God on every corner. There's a God in every temple. The idols of Africa and the Orient are abundant. There's such ignorance of those who hate the doctrines of the Trinity and the Word of God. They'll, they'll do anything to try to do away with it. To be sure, there's no more difficult doctrine to comprehend than the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity and the, the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully man. But I want to tell you that what the Bible says is not that the Word was with God and the Word was a God. It tells us that the and it's emphatic in, in the language that the word was very God, the very God of gods. God was who the word was. There's only one possibility to conclude from this, and that is that Jesus was and is the very God, the very God. Never let anyone bring your Christ down to be anything less than Jehovah, God Almighty. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. He's the Prince of Peace. The second person of the Holy Trinity. In John chapter 5 and verse 23, the Bible says that we are to honor the Son as the Father. And he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Now, this logos was a philosophical term, a philosophical concept, packed with tremendous truth. But then look at verse 2. We see that it's also packed with personality. It says, he was in the beginning with God. Literally, the Greek says, this same one. Hutos. This same one. Masculine singular. Not the neuter, tuto. Hutos. The logos was not an impersonal force. The Logos was a, a male person, not just some philosophical concept. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and God himself was the Word. What happened? What happened? Verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what Christmas is all about. That's what we celebrate. We don't celebrate, I mean, we do. Virgin Mary had a baby, laid him in a manger, that, that's wonderful. But if that's all we have, we've missed the truth of Christmas. That God stepped out of heaven and into our humanity and dwelt among us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That being translated, Matthew 1.23 adds, God with us. What is Christmas all about? What's the real meaning of Christmas? You're not going to find it in some Hallmark movie. If 
Some house without a Christmas tree because dad's mad that mom left him or mom passed away or whatever and the kids are all miserable because they can't have a tree because dad's a grumpy old bear until one day the little girl sings a song and it reminds him of mom and he goes out and buys a tree and they live happily ever after. And it's hallmark magic. No. God himself became flesh, entered his creation, entered the human race. And I want to speak to some of my Reformed friends here who don't think that we should celebrate Christmas because the Puritans did. Well, guess what? That's worth celebrating. That's worth celebrating. Whether it happened on December the 25th or September the 11th or April the 4th or April Fool's Day. Who cares? It's worth celebrating year-round. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the why. Why did God become flesh and dwell among us? Because he loved us so that he gave his only begotten son. Luke 2, 11, there's born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Why did God send us a Savior? Because we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we need salvation. You should call his name Jesus, for he'll save his people from their sins. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Think about that. Wrap your brain around that if you can. Sages, leave your contemplation. Brighter visions gleam afar. God with man is now abiding. We have seen the infant star. Come and worship. Come and worship Christ, the newborn king. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. Jesus is God in flesh. The Word was with God. The Word himself was God. God himself was the Word. And he became flesh to dwell among us. We beheld him, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is from the bosom of the Father, has declared him, has made him known. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And John writes in another place, this is the witness that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, and whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son does not have life. And these things I have written to you once again. Here's why I'm writing to you, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. He became flesh and dwelt among us so that we might become sons of God by believing in his name. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us.